thank you very much saad for uh, speaking to us uh, uh, i know you personally as well as uh, afghanistan is going through a very very critical uh, situation right now can you summarize for us what exactly happening on the ground i mean how accurate are the stories that we read in international media about the happenings in afghanistan well uh I, well, uh, I, you know, I try to catch as much as uh, as much of the news as possible, but uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, exactly what you're referring to. Let's start with the airport. The airport is an absolute mess, um, and it's a catastrophe brought uh, brought on by uh, Ashraf Ghani's decision to flee the country in the manner that he did, which triggered the collapse of the entire system. Uh, and as a result, uh, we're seeing what we're seeing today. Um, and also uh, as a byproduct of the US's, US government and the international community's inability to manage flights coming and going. And to an extent, the Taliban's inability to police the perimeter of the airport. So I think there are a lot of responsible people in terms of the mess we're in today. But I think it's mostly Ashraf Ghani and it's mostly the Americans. I think the Taliban really were dealt with a fait accompli and that they were told, listen, we've got 6,000 troops at the airport. We've got to get people out. You guys control the 20 odd thousand people surrounding the airport as best you can. Uh, they're probably the least to blame, but really it's, it's, it was an avoidable disaster and it just it's a disgrace that it's happened and that we have to deal with it today. And it'll get worse, by the way. And apparently, someone just told me today there's some some shootings and maybe some people hurt, um, which is not a surprise. Uh, what about what's happening outside Kabul? I mean, we hear about the resistance shaping up in Panjshir Valley, but we don't hear much about uh, other provinces. Uh, Panjshir yeah, and, and Andarab, which is right next door, uh, uh, there have been some clashes and people, uh, there, there were some claims and we aired that, the story yesterday of people liberating certain towns from the Taliban, just local forces. The Panjshir, uh, re, let's call it resistance, um, is made up mostly of, of Ahmad Masood, Ahmad Shah Masood's son and, um, and some other um, government officials. And of course, the, the most prominent one being uh, um, Amrullah Saleh, the former Amrullah vice Saleh. president. Yeah who's now declared himself the legitimate president of Afghanistan and, and some, some forces that uh, fought uh, um, for the Afghan uh, government, uh, special operations guys. And they, have, they seem to have helicopters and they're flying in and out of Kabul airport, ironically, from what I hear. <clears throat> so they still have, they're not, they're not totally surrounded. It, 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 it may seem like they've been surrounded completely um, but apparently they can get ammunition and supplies in by uh, using helicopters. And, and then, of course, there's also, there's been, there have been clashes in the east of the country. Some people say it's Daesh. Um, and, uh, and also there have been some, some civil uh, uh, um, dis disturbances, people protesting and, and uh, 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 coming out on, uh, onto the streets. But generally speaking, the situation seems to be pretty much under the control of the Taliban. They have managed to, um, you know, they're managing to consolidate their rule over the country. They're uh, starting to provide basic services. The uh, customs offices are open, products are coming and going. Um, people, I think, are able to travel in and out of uh, Pakistan to Afghanistan. I think Central Asia opened up yesterday. <clears throat> mostly for goods. So you're starting to see things back to normal. Uh, Iraq's opened up. Uh, the banks have yet to open, hadn't opened as of last night, but yesterday afternoon. But uh, we'll just have to wait and see as to when that happens. Have you been speaking to any major uh, political players in Afghanistan in the last uh, couple of weeks, particularly the Taliban, directly or indirectly? <clears throat> We talk to everyone. We, uh, I speak to um, uh, President Karzai, uh, Abdullah Abdullah, um, all of the government officials who are either in Kabul or outside. Uh, 
outside government officials. We speak to the Taliban, obviously, um, either directly or indirectly. Uh, we speak to uh, folks in Panjshir. Um, our news guys uh, are in touch with them. Uh, we speak to civil society members and media members. Uh, so that's our job. Our job is to talk to everyone, to gauge what's going on. <clears throat> but as Afghans, of course, we're, of course, we're also concerned about the, the future of the country. And, um, you know, we were trying to figure out, you know, what's what the, the best ways of engaging this, 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 you know, this new movement that's going to take charge, obviously. Um, the, you know, Afghanistan is facing three crises. There's a political crisis, of course, as you gathered. There's a humanitarian crisis. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of internally displaced people um, and probably one and a half to two million individuals wishing to get out of the country, of which probably 50 to 100,000 may get out through Kabul airport if given the opportunity. And then we have this sort of this economic crisis, which no one has thought about that, you know, today with, with the economy paralyzed, this is going to have a devastating impact on, on the nation. 35 million people, billions going through to the economy through um, development assistance. All of those uh, projects are on hold now. So I think the world needs to needs to pay attention. And um, and Afghanistan, if we have a massive humanitarian and economic crisis that's going to force millions of people to leave the country. And they will end up in Europe, for example. If there's the drug trade gets out of control, um, Europe in particular is going to suffer. Or if terrorism uh, and terrorist organizations can, you know, start going back into Afghanistan, the impact will be global. So people need to figure out how, how to engage with Afghanistan, with the new people in the country. Um, it's it's a big challenge, and uh, we've we've got our work cut out for us for, for us um, in the coming in the coming weeks. Uh, since two days, we have been hearing a lot about the presence of ISIS in Kabul. How critical is this? Well, I think they've always had a presence. So they, you know, they've had sleeper cells, and they have uh, uh, they they obviously have infiltrated some of the institutions because they've they've been effective and detonating their bombs and killing a lot of people. They've also been active, I think, in the eastern part of the country, east, uh, the, the eastern uh, provinces of Afghanistan. Listen, I, I, you know, it's, uh, they're there. Uh, so, uh, um, of this opportunity uh, to strike uh, and also to recruit, uh, um, this, is the, this is their time so to speak. I mean, they're obviously not as dominant as the Taliban, but they will attempt to, you know, create their own narrative. Uh, but uh, do you, I mean, uh, the reports earlier suggested that they and Taliban were at loggerheads with each other. Are they in cahoots with each other now, or uh, is the relationship still uh, very hostile, as it was reported earlier? I, well, there's no doubt that some Taliban members and members of ISIS, there's no doubt that maybe perhaps um, some of the infrastructure and the know-how um, and the contacts of the Taliban were also used by ISIS. Uh, but the danger for the Taliban is that, that, that they will you know, peel away supporters and fighters of the Taliban to join the ranks of ISIS. Uh, that's, you know, that's something that's it's, it's clear danger to, to the Taliban. Um, but right now, uh, I suspect that sort of if you look at the institutions, you know, the Taliban movement and ISIS, that they're enemies, uh, that they view each other as, you know, as, as threats uh, in terms of representing um, sort of an ideologically driven armed movement, political, armed slash political movement. Um, but, but, you know, ISIS will be a threat to Afghanistan and the Taliban uh, in the foreseeable future. All right. I, I mean, moving away from this, I mean, uh, I understand that you own and run a lion's share of uh, media in Afghanistan. What are your concerns right now as an entrepreneur, uh, uh, you know, who, have, who has invested heavily in the media in Afghanistan? Well, I, th I think... Um, um, 
continuity, I mean, two things. Uh, the lives of our staff members is very important for us, their well-being. And secondly, continuity, to be able to continue the work that we've done over the last 20 years. Uh, the former, uh, a lot of our staff members are leaving and or have left, and we will give them the support that they need uh, in order to put them, uh, you know, say, provide them with, if we can, it's difficult, safe passage to the airport. And once they get to the airport, obviously, uh, flights to third countries. Um, and in, in, in terms of continuity, it's important for us to, A, keep our doors open to be able to continue transmitting broadcasting. But more importantly, uh, to be able to report on facts, uh, as we have been over the last 18 years, to 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 be the truth tellers that we've been to cha champion the narratives that we've championed um, um, or the values that we've championed whether it's women's rights or freedom of expression or minorities so i think those are the challenges that we will face in the weeks ahead are you still sending women reporters uh, to the field <laughs> well if, the, if we the thing is a lot of our women reporters have gone to the airport to leave but we, for us, it's important to, we, we, we don't want any changes to the way that we operate the business. Uh, we have, we have uh, cut back on you know, some of our more risque programming, like music film clips with lots of flesh and so forth, and some of the more controversial soap operas. But pretty much everything else is business as usual in terms of our transmissions. And in terms of the email host, uh, presenting a program or a female reporter out on the streets doing vox pops or doing interviews that we will continue um, as we have done in the past. Have you received any, any clear assurance from Taliban that they would not interfere with the way you uh, run your uh, media outlets? Yeah, we've received uh, verbal assurances. They have visited with us. They have interviewed with us. Um, as a matter of fact, the deputy cultural uh, commissioner was on on our, on our morning program, the sort of the the the, the morning show. Uh, today uh, they came to the station two days ago. Uh, we've received verbal assurances, but this is a strange time too uh, for the Taliban. It's important to consolidate their hold over the country. It's it's a form of of a charm offensive. They have to win hearts and minds. They have to convince the political establishment to work with them. Um, they have to convince the world that they, they are ready to do business with, with the world. Um, so I, I, I think that they'll be keen to project this image of, of themselves, which is moderate and forward thinking. Um, but, but, but the reality is that we have to wait for the government to form. We have to wait for the media directive. The proof's in the pudding. And, and you know, it's too early for us to speculate. Uh, are you seeing any signs that Taliban uh, 2.0 will be more benign, inclusive, tolerant, and uh, humane? It, it's mixed, but overall the signs are good. Um, uh, well, I, as I said, it's too early to speculate. This could be just a strategy uh, to, to win over support, both you know, domestically and internationally. Um, but I, the signs are more positive because I think there's a realization, certainly with the, with the senior membership, the country has changed. I mean, you have to remember Afghanistan's population was 21 million. Now it's 30, 35 million. Uh, the country's population has gone up by like 70%. It's, it, it's an extraordinary change in, in, terms, of, in, in terms of any country uh, for the country to almost double in, in 65% uh, of the population is under the age of 20. Uh, so 65% of the population has never experienced a Taliban type rule. They're engaged, they watch the media, they're on social media, they use WhatsApp and Facebook. Uh, but by the way, I'm not just talking about the, uh, the Afghans who, in the major cities uh, who are not supporters of the Taliban, even the supporters of the Taliban, even their foot soldiers, I've gotten used to Facebook, I've gotten used to WhatsApp. WhatsApp and Telegram and Signal, they too are engaged. They may be consuming a different type of content, but they use all, all the modern technologies uh, and platforms. So it's a changed country. And I think the Taliban also realize, or they should realize, 
that the country, given how vulnerable it is economically and, and so forth, that they will need international recognition, international support. If the world stops assisting and helping and working with the Afghan government, you're going to have millions of people starving. And, and a, a country that's starving is always more difficult to manage and govern. Uh, how inclusive can uh, a Taliban establishment get? Because on the one hand, there well, is talk about an inclusive government. On the other side, we don't have one. And on their implementation of Sharia law and their rigid interpretation of Islam and so on, right? Yeah, exactly. They have a constituency that's going to demand a more conservative approach to things. And they have to balance that with a world that expects more moderate, more liberal policies. Uh, uh, and approach to things. So they have to c reconcile those two, you know, opposite uh, pulls, so to speak. Uh, um, blows himself up. He doesn't do it for political power. He does it because he believes in the ideology. So the Taliban cannot ignore what the core base is going to demand, while at the same time trying to sort of balance what the world is asking for. Um, I, I think one of the reasons why it's important for, to, for people to engage, including your government, is because there's this window um, to work with them so that they do have an inclusive approach. I mean, I know that there have been discussions with Hamad Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah and a lot of other political leaders, um, but it's, it's, this is the time to strike. This is the time to say to them, listen, if you are more engaged globally you will have a much easier time to govern. And, and this will be a win-win. It'll be a win for your political movement. It'll be a win for the world because the world doesn't have to deal with refugees, with your drugs and with your terrorism. Um, and, you know, we'll see. Because I think that they also realize that if they mistreat people and they start to actually target people and they starve people, that opposition will, will grow in the country against their rule. Um, and th that will be the beginning of something new. Uh, don't forget, Asha Afghani's government was corrupt and very unpopular, but there are local leaders uh, who, if they see that, you know, there's, that Afghanistan is no longer a just country, that their interests are not taken into account, that they will start to resist as well. If I may ask you, who are the Taliban uh, in terms of demographics? Uh, how different are they now compared to, you know, their previous avatar? Uh, uh, before the Americans unseated them? Well, I mean, there's, you know, firstly, there's a political wing and the military wing and, and, uh, and, and the, the, the movement's leadership, uh, senior leadership has always been, well, predominantly from the greater Kandahar area, although they do have the Haqqanis and others. So, but what they've attempted to do of late has been to include others. And they made inroads with the Uzbeks and the Tajiks uh, in the in the north, and we've seen, you know, the, the the result of that was, of course, a total collapse of the north in favor of the Taliban. So they they have made inroads, but it's still, I think, the movement. I mean, I'm, you can't generalize, but I think the Kandahari Taliban are still the most dominant group, um, and they're seen as by many as, as perhaps more conservative, perhaps more independent. Uh, of Pakistan than say the Haqqani networks. Um, so we, we will perhaps see this tug of war within the Taliban as well as to who, which group will prevail ultimately. They've, they've always sh shown a united front. They've always sh shown to the world that they, they govern through consensus. That it's an inclusive approach to all things, including military, cultural, and political. But now they're in power, so things may change a little bit for them. All right. So uh, right now, uh, are you foreseeing the possibility of a civil war-like situation in, in the near future? Uh, what's our situation? A civil war. Right the second? No. Ask me the same question in two months, I'll, I'll have a different answer. I mean, uh, their approach and their the way they govern uh, and how they manage the, the three crises I talked about uh, will determine as to whether people rise up against them or not. India is nowhere in the picture as far as Afghanistan is concerned. Uh, how do you look at it? 
Well, India, India's blunder was that it supported individuals rather than Afghanistan. They, you know, they doubled down on five individuals. They backed them to the hilt. Uh, I remember, you know, attending conferences in Delhi, and I always with, with Afghanistan, with the institutions, rather than with individuals. Um, and I think that was a mistake. But I, just, I, I think India also has a crucial role. I think I'm sure the Taliban, you know, the Taliban don't want to be beholden just to Pakistan. I mean, the Taliban are now in power. They can deal with it, whoever they want. Um, and uh, engaging with them, I even suggested like two years ago when I was at the Racina conference uh, to, to many of our friends in Delhi that you should engage the Taliban. There's no reason for you not to. Um, and, and, and and of course, if they're going to dominate the future government of the country, the, India has to be engaged. Uh, and I'm sure that they would also welcome them. But, but right now, India is not even speaking to the Russians and the Chinese, you know, who are actually involved. Uh, India, you know, seems we are still talking to the Americans who are nowhere in the scene, right? Yeah, but Indians, are, you know, the Indian government, I mean, they have to be pragmatic and they have to deal with things on the ground. Um, uh, and as, as, as things shift, they, sh they should realign their, their, you know, the way they, they, they tackle these issues. India can play very well. India is close to the, to, uh, to the Russians and the Central Asians uh, and, of course, Iran. Um, um, India has been a big funder of projects inside of Afghanistan that help will be... Uh, uh, by not just the Taliban, but the people of Afghanistan, and and I think to to be honest with you, I mean the the the, the Taliban, you know, they don't want to be, you know, a client of Pakistan's forever. I mean, they, they, for them, it was a means to an end, not an end in itself. So, uh, I. The Indians ought to reassess the way they tackle this and become a little bit more aggressive in terms of their outreach um, with 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 the folks in Kabul today. Listen, I think it's important for our, for for our friends in India to know that the Afghans uh, have always appreciated uh, India's India's interest in Afghanistan. Uh, the connection to Afghanistan is not just economic, but it's also cultural. It's social. Uh, you know, people. Uh, prefer visiting an Indian hospital and any other hospital. People prefer watching an Indian Bollywood film to any other type of film. Uh, people, when they have the opportunity, would like to visit India rather than any other, uh, any other country. And I think that the people-to-people -people engagement is important and the connection is important. And they've also been appreciative of all the assistance India has given to the Afghan nation. But, and I think that's why it's, for India, they have to think longer term. Uh, and they have to align their interests uh, with, with, with the Afghan nation rather than sort of individuals. And I think the mistake was that they had doubled down on key individuals, which they shouldn't have. But, uh, you know, India has to, has to broaden its outreach in the country and, and also in the region. Thank you so very much, sir. Wonderful talking to you. Thank you.